Hello, my name is Masha Livitz. I'm an endocrine surgeon here at UCLA. Thank you so much for joining us here today. Um, and I'll be discussing adrenal causes of high blood pressure. So please ask any questions you have on Twitter using hashtag UCLAMDChat or comment on Facebook. Today we'll be discussing first some basic facts about high blood pressure, then what are the adrenal glands, what is their function and location, and how do they factor into high blood pressure, and then what are the medical and surgical treatments of adrenal disorders. So some basic facts about high blood pressure. The blood pressure is the force of blood that pushes against your arteries. Your arteries are the blood vessels that carry blood from your heart to the rest of the body. So if the force is too high inside of them, that can damage the wall of the arteries. And this can lead to the risk of heart disease, kidney failure, and stroke when the blood pressure is too high. High blood pressure, also known as hypertension, is very common. It affects about half of adults in the United States. The normal blood pressure is less than 120 over 80, so anything higher than that for a sustained period of time is referred to as high blood pressure. There are some known risk factors for high blood pressure. These include obesity diet, in particular a very high salt diet, um, excessive alcohol intake, all of those increase the risk of high blood pressure. But in most cases, we don't know the specific underlying cause why an individual patient has high blood pressure. And so we call that essential hypertension when we don't know the specific cause. In some cases, there is a direct cause that can be identified, and that's referred to as secondary hypertension. So about 10% of people who have high blood pressure have some underlying cause that is potentially correctable and that could improve their high blood pressure. This includes kidney disease, specifically a blockage in the kidney artery, sleep apnea, adrenal disorders, which I'll focus on today, um, and we should consider these secondary causes in patients who are diagnosed with high blood pressure at a very early age, less than 30 years of age, or diagnosed later in life, older than 55 years of age. Or if somebody has high blood pressure and it suddenly worsens, they suddenly require multiple additional medications, then we should think about testing for additional underlying causes. So what are the adrenal glands and how do they factor into this? The adrenal glands are small organs which are located right here. And they are on top of the kidney, which is over here. They're about the size of a walnut, and they sit on top of the kidney. So the kidney is called the renal. So adrenal means sitting on top of the kidney. So the adrenal glands are on top of the kidney. They're very small, and they respond to stress, and they keep our body in balance. So again, if this is your body here, and here's your neck, your head, your chest, and your abdomen, here is where the kidneys are. They're closer to the back, and then the adrenal glands sit here on top of the kidneys. The adrenal glands make hormones. That's what their job is. There are two different parts of the adrenal gland. There's the cortex, which is the outer layer here, and then the medulla, which is the inner layer over here. The cortex has different zones which make different hormones. So the glomerulosa makes a hormone called mineralocorticoids that regulates your mineral balance. Then the middle layer here makes glucocorticoids which regulates your glucose or sugar metabolism. This zone, the reticularis, makes androgens which are sex hormones. And then the medulla, which is the innermost layer over here, makes stress hormones, specifically adrenaline hormone. So how can disorders of the adrenal gland cause high blood pressure? The adrenal gland usually produces just the right amount of hormone that you need in your body depending on what the situation is. So at certain times, particularly more stressful times, you may need more stress-related hormones and then your adrenal gland will produce those. But there's a very complicated negative feedback system so that the adrenal glands communicate with your brain and know exactly how much hormone to produce. If you have adrenal gland nodule, it can produce too much hormone that stops listening to what your brain is telling it needs and starts just producing excess hormone. And that can become a problem. So let's talk about the first hormone, which are the mineralocorticoids, also called aldosterone. The job of aldosterone is to regulate your blood pressure and electrolyte balance. Aldosterone is released by the adrenal gland and it works on the kidney to increase sodium and water absorption. So when you eat a meal, let's say if it's a very salty meal, um, then you will retain some of that salt and some of that water and the rest of it will be uh, excreted out in your urine. 
However, if you have too much aldosterone, then you retain too much of that salt and water, and that increases your blood pressure and can lead to high blood pressure. And eventually, it can also lead you to excrete too much potassium in your urine, which causes low blood levels of potassium. So who should be tested for an aldosterone-producing adrenal tumor? These are fairly rare. The specific times that we should think about them is somebody who has high blood pressure and has a low potassium level in the bloodstream. That's a red flag to check for too much aldosterone production if the potassium is low in the bloodstream and the blood pressure is high. Additionally, if somebody has very high blood pressure, greater than 150 over 100, or requires multiple medications to keep their blood pressure in a safe range. So if you're on three or more blood pressure medications, then that's something to consider is checking for the aldosterone level. And how do we diagnose it? It's really with blood tests. So we check the blood hormone levels of aldosterone, and we want to see a ratio of aldosterone to another hormone called renin. That ratio should be high, greater than 30, and the absolute aldosterone level should be also quite high, greater than 15. We always want to make sure the patient is not taking interfering medications. Pretty much everybody who's getting checked for these levels has high blood pressure and is taking multiple blood pressure medications. Some of these medications can interfere with the lab results, so we need to know what those are and adjust accordingly. And then if the aldosterone level is high in the bloodstream, that's when we get imaging to look for a nodule in the adrenal gland. And these can be quite small, the ones that are producing aldosterone. They can be only one to two centimeters in size. So if you look at this CAT scan here, here's the liver, here's the spleen over here, and here is the adrenal gland, and we see a nodule here. The normal adrenal gland is so small, it looks like a little hat. So when we see a sphere here, we know there's a nodule. Because these nodules can be very small in the cases of an aldosterone-producing nodule, sometimes we get a procedure called adrenal vein sampling. That's a procedure that the interventional radiologist performs. They put a little puncture in the groin, and then they put catheters up, and they check the aldosterone level in their left and right sides. And that will confirm which side, the left or right adrenal gland, has the nodule that's producing too much aldosterone hormone. So how do we treat this condition? There are medications that can help to block the mineralocorticoid receptors. So they help to block the effect of aldosterone in the, in the body. Um, the most commonly used medication is called spironolactone. Um, that does tend to help with the blood pressure in these cases, but it has some side effects. It causes breast tenderness and enlargement, particularly in men, that could be a big problem and very uncomfortable. Also decreased uh, libido. A newer medication in the same class is called aplerinone. It has fewer of these side effects, probably just as effective, but it's very expensive. So we don't always start with that one right away. These are the medication options, um, and the goal is to help improve the blood pressure. It also helps to normalize the potassium. Sometimes patients will still require extra potassium supplementation. I have a banana here which has a lot of potassium, but often patients have to actually take potassium pills. Um, and usually this bronolactone or plerinone on its own is not enough to control the blood pressure. Patients still generally need additional blood pressure medications. So this is not curative. If you're on this medication and you don't have surgery, you would need to be on this medication for the rest of your life. Um, however, some patients are good candidates for it. In cases of, for example, bilateral hyperplasia, um, that means that there's too much aldosterone coming from both of the adrenal glands, the left and the right one. We don't want to remove both adrenal glands, then you don't have enough hormone in your bloodstream. So those patients should have the medication rather than surgery. Or patients who are too sick to have surgery, um, the risks of anesthesia are too high for them, and those patients can also be treated with medications. But ideally, if you have an aldosterone-producing adrenal nodule, you should have surgery to have it removed. And this requires a laparoscopic adrenalectomy. So we remove the entire adrenal gland with a laparoscopic minimally invasive approach. And you can see here, this is what this adrenal nodule looks like. And here's the surrounding uh, adrenal tissue and some fat around it. And you see this nice nodule here. So the goal is to improve the blood pressure. And most patients have a significant benefit in their blood pressure once this is removed. Now, it's not always cured. Maybe about half of patients have a complete cure in their high blood pressure, meaning they don't have to take any more medications. But there are a lot of patients that have blood pressure improvement and maybe still have to take one blood pressure medication as opposed to maybe three or four before surgery, and the potassium usually becomes normal. 
Why do we treat this problem with surgery when we can? It's because untreated, patients have increased cardiovascular risks. So this was a classic study. We were looked at patients who had this aldosterone condition and then we compare them to patients who just had high blood pressure over here. And you, for example, look at the chance of stroke. There's a 13% chance of stroke in people with an aldosterone problem compared to 3% with patients who just have high blood pressure. So the next hormone that the adrenal glands that can produce, that can contribute to high blood pressure, is called cortisol. This hormone controls the metabolism of proteins, fats, and sugars, and overproduction of this hormone results in something called Cushing syndrome. Too much cortisol causes obesity, high blood pressure, high blood glucose, known as diabetes, osteoporosis, and blood clots. Some signs of Cushing syndrome are weight gain, particularly in the face, the neck, and the belly, acne, muscle weakness, easy bruising. So you see this patient here, this was before he developed Cushing syndrome, and then afterwards, you see the change in the appearance of his face, the obesity in the abdomen, um, these stretch marks here on the skin, these are all classic signs of Cushing syndrome from too much cortisol. Again, we diagnose this with laboratory testing. Cortisol secretion in the bloodstream really varies by the time of day, it tends to be highest early in the morning, lower in the evening. So we can't just check a random level. We either check it, for example, midnight uh, in the salivary tissue, we can check a 24-hour urine test or a blood level in the morning. And if those levels are very high, then we go ahead and get imaging. And you see again on a CAT scan, this is the liver, here's the spleen, here you can see the start of the kidney on the right side, and here is a big adrenal nodule over here. We do need to make sure the patient is not taking exogenous steroids. We have so many people now who are taking steroids for all kinds of reasons, for example, asthma or rheumatoid arthritis. Um, that can result in some of these similar symptoms, so we have to make sure that it's not coming from a medication. And the same reason with aldosterone, the reason we want to treat this and cure it if we can, is that people who have untreated Cushing syndrome, um, they have worse cardiovascular outcomes and even increased mortality. So in this study, um, here is a group of patients, this is what their expected mortality would be. Then this are, is the group of patients who had Cushing syndrome, but they knew the underlying cause, they were able to treat them and operate on them. And here in the lower line here, these are patients who had Cushing syndrome, but they were not able to treat them. They weren't sure exactly which side uh, the excess cortisol was coming from. So these patients, this is mortality here, um, so they really have much higher mortality if they had untreated Cushing syndrome. And in another randomized study where we compared medications to surgery for patients with Cushing syndrome, the patients who had surgery really had improved outcomes. So if you look at hypertension, for example, most of these people had hypertension before surgery, and after surgery, a quarter had a complete cure of their high blood pressure, additional 40% had a significant improvement. So surgery for Cushing syndrome from the adrenal glands also involves laparoscopic adrenalectomy. And here's what this nodule would look like when we cut it open. The other adrenal gland is often temporarily suppressed. That can be for a few months. So it takes a few months for it to really kick in and produce enough hormones. So for Cushing syndrome, when we remove the adrenal gland, we usually put people on steroids for a few months until the adrenal gland, the other one, kicks in, and then we wean them off of the steroids. So the third and final hormone that we'll talk about, something called catecholamines, this is the adrenaline hormone. These hormones are called epinephrine and norepinephrine, and this really regulates our flight or fight response. So during evolution, when we'd be running away from a big animal that was trying to you know, eat us, um, our body produces this adrenaline hormone so that we can increase our heart rate, so that we can run faster and be stronger at that time of stress. If we produce too much of this hormone, then we have a condition called pheochromocytoma, which can result in episodes of high blood pressure. So you can imagine, you know, if you're in a fight here, like this dog and cat, you're producing a lot of this adrenaline hormone, you need that. But if you're producing it inappropriately, you might just be sitting down watching TV or reading a book, you have a rush of adrenaline hormone release. That leads to episodes of headache, sweating, feeling like your heart is racing, and high blood pressure. And the blood pressure can spike to a very dangerously high level, can lead to a heart attack or a stroke. Um, 
Patients with pheochromocytoma, about one third of them have a germline mutation, which means an under, underlying genetic mutation that has caused this pheochromocytoma. There are a couple of syndromes that are associated with this particular condition. One is called MEN syndrome, multiple endocrine neoplasia, that's also associated with a certain type of thyroid cancer. There's another condition called VHL or von Hippel-Lindau, which is also associated with renal cell cancer and pancreatic tumors. So anybody with a pheochromocytoma needs genetic testing to make sure that they're not at risk for any other conditions. It also allows family members to be screened and identified, and it can impact the prognosis. Most of these pheochromocytomas are benign. There's a specific mutation called SDHB that has a 50% chance of cancer, so we need to know about that. Again, for diagnosis, um, it's really checking the hormone levels in the blood or, or the urine. And the diagnostic challenge is that those symptoms that I described, episodes of heart racing, sweating, nervousness, that can mimic a panic attack. Those symptoms can be fairly common. High blood pressure is very common, but pheochromocytomas are very rare. So if we test everybody for this condition who has symptoms, most people won't have a pheochromocytoma. So we really need to see very high levels of adrenaline hormone in the blood or urine to confirm the diagnosis. And then we get imaging, which is a CAT scan MRI or a special whole body scan. So th this is a very specific type of PET scan here where you can see the adrenal mass and you can see it light up on the PET activity part confirming that it's a pheochromocytoma. So the way we treat this is with removal, but it's very important to block the hormone release prior to surgery. At the time of the operation, when we're removing this adrenal nodule and the adrenal gland, with manipulation of the tumor, it can all of a sudden release a lot of hormone, which can make the blood pressure spike during the operation. So we block the hormone release for a few weeks before the surgery with a special type of blood pressure medication called an alpha blocker, so that the blood pressure will remain stable during the operation. And the blood pressure drops usually right away after removal of the tumor. So how do we do the surgery to remove an adrenal mass? It's usually with a laparoscopic adrenalectomy. And the laparoscopic or minimally invasive approach is really the standard of care now um, because the recovery complications so much better compared to an open approach as long as the patient is a good candidate. The mass is not too large um, so that we can do it technically safely and the patient can safely have a laparoscopic surgery. We can do it either from the front or the back with a laparoscopic approach. I prefer doing it through a retro peritoneal approach from the back. So you can see this patient is lying here on the operating table. Here's his head and his feet and then his back here and our approach is directly back here. That's because the kidney and the adrenal glands are located in the back. So this is a very direct approach. We can avoid any dissection of the organs in the front of the body. You can see these small scars here that are healed. The principles of surgery, usually we remove the entire adrenal gland in most cases to make sure uh, that this tumor does not come back or recur. We want to avoid violating the capsule or getting into the, this nodule during the surgery because even though it's probably benign, if we get into it during surgery, it could come back. And then the adrenal vein is the major blood vessel that we need to control and ligate to prevent any bleeding. We can also do this through a single incision adrenalectomy. This is an approach that I use commonly for good candidates. So you can see we can do the whole surgery laparoscopically through one little cut here. We put this device that's called a mini gel point where we have our camera and two working instruments. And this is how the patient heals after the surgery. Be, uh, barely visible scar in the back. These are some commonly asked questions about adrenal conditions and adrenal surgery. First is, what are the chances an adrenal nodule is cancerous? The good news is that in most cases, an adrenal nodule is benign and not cancerous, particularly when it's making the hormones that I talked about. If an adrenal nodule is cancerous, we usually have a high suspicion based on the imaging preoperatively. Usually the mass is quite big, over about six centimeters, and it appears invasive on the imaging. In most of these cases, we can already tell based on the imaging before surgery and the size that the chance of cancer is very, very low. Next question. Does the entire adrenal gland need to be removed? In most cases, we do remove the entire adrenal gland. The reason is that, again, we don't want this to come back. So if we remove part of the adrenal gland, potentially when we leave some of that adrenal tissue behind, that could increase the risk of it coming back in that area. And the other adrenal gland will make everything the body needs. It makes all the hormones that the body needs. So there's not that much downside. 
do I need to be on hormones after adrenal surgery? Um, only if the adrenal mass was making cortisol. So we talked about if the adrenal mass produces cortisol, the other adrenal gland will be suppressed for some period of time. So you would need hormones for maybe a few months until the other adrenal gland kicks in. For all the other conditions, you don't need to be on any hormones after the surgery. Will my quality of life be different? People worry about this because as people know that the adrenal gland makes hormones, so will this be different when one of the adrenal glands is gone? And the answer really is no, uh, because your body is very smart, um, the brain and the adrenal glands communicate well, so as long as there's not an abnormal nodule that's ignoring the brain signals, the other adrenal gland, which is normal, kicks in, makes everything your body needs, and produces the appropriate amount of hormones for you. Um, and then finally, will removal of the adrenal mass help my blood pressure? And that's really in all the conditions we talked about, that's the primary goal is to help the blood pressure. So if you have an adrenal nodule that's producing one of these hormones, then the blood pressure will certainly be improved after surgery. So in summary, high blood pressure is very common. In most cases, we don't have a specific underlying cause, but in some cases, we should investigate for a secondary cause. That's particularly if somebody's diagnosed early, at an early age, or has very resistant high blood pressure, require multiple medications for it to be controlled. The adrenal hormones that can lead to high blood pressure are aldosterone, cortisol, and catecholamines, which is the adrenaline hormone. Um, and then the last point is that adrenal nodules are fairly common. Um, they're present in about 5% of patients. As we image people more and more for all kinds of things, you go to the emergency room for a kidney stone and you would get a CAT scan, or you come in with appendicitis and you get a CAT scan, we're discovering more and more of these adrenal nodules. The good news is that most of them are benign and not producing too much hormone and we can leave them alone. So all of these nodules, when we discover them, they do need to be tested to make sure they're not producing too much hormone. We need to look at the imaging to make sure it's not concerning for a cancer. Um, but most of them will be benign and can be observed. Um, so again, if there are any questions, please ask them on Twitter using hashtag UCLAMDChat or comment on Facebook. Thank you so much for your attention today, and we look forward to you joining us for the next webinar.